Welcome to the Thriving Farmer Podcast. I'm your host, Michael Kilpatrick. Our mission is to inspire, educate, and celebrate sustainable farming. We believe that you can build a profitable, sustainable farm that gives you true farm freedom. Join us as we talk to farmers, innovators, educators, and entrepreneurs to glean their top takeaways in business and life. Hey, Thriving Farmers, Michael Kilpatrick here with yet another episode of the Thriving Farmer podcast. And today, my guest is a special one. Dr. Ingham uncovered the soil food web nearly four decades ago and has been pioneering research about soil food web ever since. Widely recognized as the world's foremost soil biologist, she's passionate about empowering ordinary people to bring the soils and their communities back to life. Dr. Elaine's soil food web approach has been used to successfully restore the ecological functions of soils on more than 5 million acres of farmland all over the world. Welcome to the podcast. Oh, glad to be here. Glad to be invited by you, Michael. Yeah. So talk to us a little bit. You know, you have a long history with doing soils and, uh, you know, just diving into all the intricacies there. You know, back when you started, what, what, what really kind of spoke to you from the soils and why did that become a passion? Um, For me, it was probably when I got to Colorado State University and my major professor sent me around to all the other soil departments, people who Mm -hmm. had any aspect of um, working with soil. So the hydroponics people, the horticulture people, the crop science, the agronomists, all of those different people. And he asked me to ask them if uh, the research project that we were going to do on soil fungi and trying to figure out what they're doing in soil uh, was worth doing. Mm. Uh, was, this a, was this a good idea? And, um, you know, when you think about the fact that fungi have been on this planet for the last 3.5 billion years, they got to be doing something, right? Mm-hmm. Bacteria have been here for 4 billion years. Uh, you know, protozoa, nematodes, they've all come along, um, arrived on the planet and started doing their thing for a lot longer than human beings have been here. And so they have to be doing something, right? So I figured it, it was a good bet. But yeah. I was amazed that to a person, all of them said, oh, that's not a good idea. You're not going to be able to get a job after you get finish up your PhD, because bacteria and fungi and soil don't, they don't really do anything. Mm-hmm. They're just kind of, they're kind of there. You know, when we go out and we apply a pesticide or an inorganic fertilizer, um, sure, we kill a lot of things, but you know, they just come back the next day. Mm. Wait, wait a minute, how, how could they possibly think about how small they are? They're not gonna make it two or three miles. Yeah. Um, they're not gonna, just show up they've got to have food they've got to have the right environment for them they've got to have the right kind of water they don't like disturbed soil we keep tilling soil and it means we're going backwards in succession destroying whatever benefits had been built what after the last tillage Mm -hmm. and you till now you put yourself right back at the beginning succession well, what's the plant that Mother Nature promotes at the very beginning of the whole successional process all the way to, you know, uh, old growth forests? So the first plants she sends in to start dealing with the problem are the weeds. Mm-hmm. So every time you till, you are blessing yourself with more weeds. It just, mm-hmm. you know, people just don't understand. So I went around and you know talked to them all and they were all very negative and it it was kind of a we know that these organisms are really important it needs there needs to be somebody who's going to explain that and quantify it and make us understand how all these things interact and work together and so when I finished up my PhD then I went to work at the natural resource ecology lab in Fort Collins and really started to look at what are the roles and functions of all these different organism groups in the soil. So working with Dave Coleman's group at Colorado State, that was, that was the best. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And, and I've never had a problem getting a job. 
That's good. <laughs> now, uh, now when, so, so you went around, you asked them all, then you came back and did you tell your professor, we still need to do it? What was the consensus after that? Do you say, well, if everyone says no, we should just do it anyway, just. Uh... Well, he, he knew what, you know, he, he wanted me to experience mm. that reality to see what I was up against. Um, I think it was really kind of a, does this person have the mental fortitude to go against the grain? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I just said, um, I think fungi are such wonderful creatures. They're doing something in the soil and we've got to show what, what they're doing. And so my uh, research was really on finding an easier way to assess fungal biomass in the soil and be able to differentiate how much is active and mm -hmm. how much is just hanging around waiting for the good times to get rolling again. Interesting, because like, let's say you till under a cover crop or put a cover crop down into the soil. They always talk about that incredible spike in biological activity, but even that tilling is you'd rather see it more laid down on top and then the, the worms pull it in. Talk to us about kind of like how, the, how that cycle should be working. Yeah, the way it's supposed to work is you have perennial plants mm -hmm. on the surface of the, the ground cover. Uh, yeah. And um, certainly when, when we're dealing with agricultural crops, we don't want really tall cover crops. Yeah. Because you know you paid all that money to put the seed in and and it grew like it was supposed to and now you've got to get rid of it. Yeah. So you got to go in and mow. And how many of us are good at not hitting your trees if you happen to have already planted into it? Yeah. Got to go and mow it. You accidentally mow down a quarter of your crop or something. So that's not really the wisest way to do that. Um, we should do as Mother Nature does, which is to make sure that there's a low growing perennial cover plants on the soil surface that will prevent your soil from being hit by raindrops. One of the most compacting factors is mm. raindrops hitting on bare surface of the soil. And guess who that helps out? Yeah, it's the weeds. Mm -hmm. So we want to have that cover so that those raindrops hit the vegetation and that bouncy spring now shatters those large drops coming down from you know however many feet above the planet um, those clouds were that big trip they're really going at quite some acceleration due to gravity mm -hmm. and they hit that soil and compact well we make sure they get intercepted and make it perennials instead of having to buy seed every year and every year you've got to go out there and you've got to put it into the ground and then come springtime you've got the problem how do you get rid of it now hmm. you put it out of herbicide you till it down you mow it in whatever it's a lot of work to do that so let's walk around that let's not have to be doing that and then those plants are also putting exudates into the soil all the time feeding the biology in your soil and helping those balances of the bacteria and the fungi, the protozoa and the nematodes, the microarthropods and the earthworms, get them into the right balances for the crop you want to grow. Mm -hmm. And then you don't really have to do much else besides put the seed in the ground and you should be able to walk away and not do anything except maybe on occasion take a walk through and make sure Mother Nature isn't sending you any little surprises, but mm -hmm. we go for a long time with most of our growers where that's what they're really doing. They're putting the seed in in the springtime. They're watching to make sure nothing untoward is happening. And then they're harvesting. And mm -hmm. that's all the work they do. So, you know, for, let's say the larger scale crops, you know, this works really well. Let's say the corns and the grains and then the perennial cropping, obviously it's a fabulous system, but unfortunately we're still doing the things like, you know, radishes or lettuce, or like in our case, strawberries, what kind of, uh, how, how have growers doing those crops kind of integrated all of this, obviously probably mulching or what are your, what are your thoughts around those crops? Yeah, they can, they can mulch, not a problem, but still that, you know, every four weeks, you're going to have to go out there and put on another layer of mulch, typically. Mm -hmm. So let's get the perennial cover crops. But now we know where our rows of uh, onions or carrots or peas or you know whatever you're putting in 
you know, you know, you harvest, you want to go put in uh, the next crop and how many can you get in in the growing season. So uh, you want to, you know where the rows are going to be and you keep those clear mm -hmm. of the, you know, the runners that are coming out from some of your perennial plants, the uh, branches that, you know, the plants, well, you know, there's nobody in my way here. I'm going to put a, well, just cut it off when you go in to put the seeds in. Gotcha. You just, yeah, you know, push them back. And long before they recover, those perennial plants re recover, the plant's going to germinate and going to be popping up out of the soil. When we put the right sets of microorganisms on the seeds, we know that we will reduce the um, time to germination by about half of what you get when you're dealing with a uh, seed that has only toxic chemicals, pesticides, and all kinds mm -hmm. of uh, synthetics all over the surface. It takes them much longer to germinate and grow. Whereas if we can get the good biology on those seed surfaces, they pop right up out of the ground. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about that. So you're talking about treating the seeds with basically a, a micro mix, like usually like a powder or something, or even like a, a seed coating that when they hit the hit the ground, that they will, you know, they will start to interact and start to growing faster. Yep. Okay, very cool. And is that something that's commercially available? Is that something that you kind of you need to create based on your farm's, uh, you know, soil food web? If you can start making your own compost and okay. make sure that it stays aerobic, the mm -hmm. whole, you know, root systems are obligately aerobic. In terrestrial mm -hmm. soils, you can't have anaerobic compacted places because that's going to kill your root system. Mm -hmm. That's why often when you dig up a root, dig up a plant, you see the plant roots went down to some compaction layer and they could not get through because the anaerobic conditions killed those organisms, killed those roots mm -hmm. so that that anaerobic environment is deadly to the root mm -hmm. system of your plant and they turn and go sideways. Now they're fighting with all their neighbors for the very limited amount of nutrient um, water, um, they're not going to be healthy. They're not going to be uh, doing very well. They're uh, going to be highly susceptible to any disease causing organism because they don't have their roots down deep into the soil. So we want to make sure that all of that gets rebuilt. And so we'd like to have people understand they need to make their own um, compost or mm -hmm. find a neighbor who's willing to do that. And a lot of what Soil Food Web is doing now is trying to get people to be the makers of the um, high diversity, uh, a minimum amount of the bacteria and the fungi, protozoa, and nematodes that will make most of our row crop um, uh, plants um, very, you know, very, very healthy, grow very well, be resistant, you know, be able to build the structure in the soil so the roots can go down and get water that's stored way deep in the soil. So all of those things are inoculated in that really good compost. So whether mm -hmm. you make it yourself or whether you buy it from somebody else, kind of like the way you buy inorganic fertilizer now, mm -hmm. instead you'd go out and you'd get really good compost, mix it into the soils and get those organisms growing because you already have the perennial cover crops on there you're going to be feeding all of the organisms that you need in your soil and and you're not having to apply things through the irrigation system you're not having to go out and spray you don't have to go out and put on massive amounts of mulch or uh, whatever you want to put down it's already there from the beginning mm -hmm. of the growing season it's already there all right. So let's break down compost for a little bit. What's your best way to apply it? Because obviously, if let's say you're doing perennial cropping, is it just to spread it on top of the soil and the, the earthworms will work it down in? Um, what's, what, what have you found? I usually put an application of compost on the soil surface mm -hmm. at the beginning of the growing season. So in the spring. Okay. Um, and then from that point on, we're not going to put any more solids down. And, yeah. And typically along about year three, you don't even have to put the solids down. 
Gotcha. You want to leave the residue from your last crop on the surface. Don't till it in. You destroy the structure and now you're back at Weed City. Mm -hmm. um, you want that um, cover, that mulch to be decomposed as rapidly as possible by the microorganisms in your soil. And now you've got more soil. So you mm -hmm. keep building year after year after year. You build and build and build. We're sequestering carbon. You want to make carbon credits? Talk to the people that I work with who um, deal with that. And they can you know, talk you through all of that process where you're not going to believe the amount of money you can make if you're doing carbon sequestration. Mm. So we, if we get the fungi back into the system, and like you mentioned, when you go out and you mix and you turn your soil, that you get a big burst of CO2 coming out of that soil. Well, mm -hmm. that's your bacteria decomposing a massive amount of your organic matter. And that's not what you want to do. That's not the way to get things to work well in your soil is to try to get those bacteria and billions of bacteria uh -huh. instead of being properly balanced as they should be with the fungi. So you've sliced and diced and crushed and wiped out the fungi and you've overindulged the bacteria. And so mm. things are all out of whack. You're again back at that early stage of succession where nitrates are going to be the predominant form of nitrogen when you've got a bacterial dominated soil. Mm -hmm. And now that selects for the weeds. So mm. now you got to grow your fungal community back. Don't rely on CO2 to tell you what's going on in your soil because bacteria, when they utilize any organic matter, bacteria have to concentrate the nitrogen, the phosphorus, sulfur, magnesium, calcium, sodium, and all of those things have to be concentrated. And the only way to do that is to blow off the excess carbon as CO2. So 80% uh, huh. of your organic matter is going to go up into the atmosphere as a greenhouse gas, no less, and cause a lot of problems in your soil. Everything's going to be out of balance. Whereas if you get the fungi growing in your soil, the fungi are going to take most of the things they decompose. They only blow 20% of that carbon off as carbon dioxide, and they are concentrating all of the rest of it. The fungi mm -hmm. put down layers of carbon along their um, the hyphae to prevent those hyphae from being susceptible to being eaten by microarthropods. So the fungi don't like to be eaten. How strange is that? They're putting mm -hmm. down those materials to prevent themselves from being so susceptible to their predators who like to come along and eat them. So keep that carbon in your soil. And so 80% of that carbon utilized by fungi are going to be stored in the soil as fungal biomass. Mm -hmm. When people go into soil and they start assessing how much carbon do you have in your soil, most of the methods miss the fungal biomass altogether and it's not counted. Whereas mm. you count the fungal biomass and you've got tons more carbon sequestered in your soil if you do your assessment correctly. So let's you know, get all of those things back into your soils, get this food web growing so that, yeah, you can not have to go crazy trying mm -hmm. to get maximum yields. Although typically we see at least an increase of about 20%. The first year you get this system up and going, we'll see 20% increases in yields quite easily. Mm -hmm. Now, you did talk about uh, compaction earlier, and so I wanted to circle back around to that. Um, obviously, as healthier soils will start to work that out themselves, but you know, let's say you come with a start with a very dead soil. Is there a place for you know doing deep ripping or trying to break up that hard pan? Yeah, the, when you're going into a field that's been in heavy chemical mm -hmm. pan, you know, um, agriculture, you've got to you know, break things up a bit yeah. in that soil. Yeah. And so, yeah, the best thing to do is put down a layer of the compost and immediately after come along or, you know, spray the, um, blow the, I always like, um, you know, snow blowers, 
to okay, yeah. spread my compost out. It's way easier. And so you blow that out in front of you, and then you come along with the tillage equipment hooked up behind you, and you get that tillage. You break up all of that compacted material. That should be the last time you're mm. ever going to have to do that, because from now on, it's going to be the biology. These organisms, bacteria, fungi, protozoa, nematodes, microarthropods, earthworms, mm -hmm. they're going to be the things building structure. Mm -hmm. And they will build structure down as deep as we've seen some cases where it's 250 feet that the biology and the upper layers of the soil have built structure and the root oh, wow. systems are going down that far. Wow. What crops are they're going down that deep? That deep. Um, it's mostly um, um, shrubs and vines yeah. and trees and, okay. of course, yeah. old growth forests. Um, yeah. Probably the deepest I've ever seen um, grass, for example, goes down at least 25 feet. Wow. A really productive, yeah. um, you know, uh, perennial yeah. uh, um, uh, uh, grasses. But even, you know, things that we think of as, you know, or mid-succession, earlier succession, they'll put their root systems down a good five to 10 feet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I remember being out in Utah and they had just, they had just started working up. They're actually doing some um, perk testing for wells. Uh, it's not for wells, for septics. And there was a, a old growth field of alfalfa. I'm going to say old growth had been there for forever. And some of the size of those alfalfa roots were literally the size of my forearm, yeah. just, you know, massive, massive. Um, and again, I don't think it was necessarily organically managed, but just looking at that and being like, oh my gosh, how deep were they going down? Um, but that's, that blows my mind because we're sitting on an aquifer that's water is 40 feet down. Um, and so you kind of think about it. These trees are literally in some aspects, these trees around you probably don't need water at all because their mm -hmm. roots, if they're going that deep, are just sitting in that water whenever they want it. Yep. And if uh, your grasses uh, are detecting that there's water deep down there, they will grow down to get that water if they need it in the middle of the summertime. So huh. I would not be surprised if you didn't have root systems of your grasses. Yeah growing down that deep, but you got to have the microorganisms to build that structure mm -hmm. so that they can, if you will, taste the water. It's down there. I've got to get my roots down there so mm -hmm. that this can be a happy plant all through that growing season. Okay. So let's talk, we've, we've, we're talking compost. Let's keep on that. Cause I think compost is such a key aspect to any farm. Um, what do you recommend a farmer start with when they're kind of getting, starting with compost? And it, obviously bringing in the material can be a lot challenging too, if you have a small farm. Um, so obviously that's where you might want to work with somebody else, but uh, is there a specific mix it, you like to see? And it, and it depends on the size of your farm. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're growing on, you know, 12 acres, 20 acres, you only need two kind of cages of compost that you make in the whole year. Okay. So you make one compost pile at the beginning of the summer where you have lots of materials uh, that you want to, you know, um, decompose early in the springtime. Um, you know, put in some high nitrogen um, mm -hmm. plants so you can harvest those and put them into your, uh, uh, into your compost pile. Uh, you could save some materials from the last um, growing season mm -hmm. and have everything ready to go first thing in the spring. And then you'll repeat that at harvest time. So during the busy time of your summer growing, you don't have to fuss with the compost. You don't mm -hmm. need that much if you're making really good stuff. You add that compost inoculum uh, into the soil or into the mulch on the surface of the soil if you're putting in um, mulch to you know, prevent compaction because of rain or compaction from driving mm -hmm. over the rows and stuff. So you really only need a small amount relative to everything you're doing. Now, we work with some growers that have a thousand hectares. Mm -hmm. And now we've got to have an industrial yeah. compost making process. And we're constantly making new compost, but they also have enough land yeah. that they can take an acre or two or hectare or two for us to grow the alfalfa, grow the beans, grow everything that we need mm -hmm. to go into those large scale windrows. Okay. So we always start 
with a recipe. And this is another reason why you want to start with small piles, something that's going to be, you know, maybe about five feet high and four and a half feet wide. So that goes into your uh, cage that you're going to keep the compost in contact with itself. Um, you always want a recipe. You start with a 10% high nitrogen uh, layer. You uh, put in 30% green mm -hmm. and you want a mixture. You don't ever want all of the high nitrogen to be alfalfa. You okay. want it to be a mix of something. So beer mash works great. Mm -hmm. All kinds of those kind of fermented um, seeds are great for um, putting into compost as a high nitrogen source. Okay. Then 30% green material, make it a mixture of a number of different things. So mow down your weeds. The weed seed can go in there. That's fine. You're, we're going to kill it with the thermal temperatures that we get. Mm -hmm. And then 30% wood chips, if you can find them. Um, mm -hmm. And then 30% other brown kind of material, wide C to N, mostly carbon kind of things. So okay. great way to get you know, if you've got orchards, you're doing all your pruning, you chip it up, throw in the compost pile. Mm -hmm. So um, that's the best recipe. So with your first pile, you start to monitor temperature, moisture, all of the aspects. You start to get a feeling for how your starting materials are going to be a little bit unique. And so we typically like to help you through those first three piles that you're going to make yourself. So you have somebody that you can always go to the phone and go, my compost yeah. pile is, is acting really strange. Yeah, yeah. And then you, you tell us what it is. We say, oh, that's here's how you fix that. And mm -hmm. no, you don't have to start your pile over again. You just go get some of this and you put it into the middle of the pile and everything gets resolved. So um, good reason to have mentors on hand. Mm -hmm. um, and so our courses at Soil Food Web are uh, really based on we want to have mentoring going on because we never know exactly what problems different people are going to have. So it takes typically, we want to see that the temperature in that pile rise. So by the third day, you are above 131 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, typically, I'd like to see the um, temperature get a little bit higher. You have to wait three days if you're at 131 um, Fahrenheit to kill enough of the diseases and pests and seeds and mm -hmm. all the things you don't want in your compost pile will be killed by that temperature. So then you turn it and you make sure to take the top part of your compost pile, reserve it to one side. The middle of your pile goes in as the bottom layer. Okay. And then you put the top where, where it's now the middle and what yep. was on the bottom is now on the top. So okay. Just constantly, every time you turn, you make sure that you're doing that kind of mixing. So everything gets into that hot middle part of the pile. Everything has the high enough, has high enough temperatures applied to it so that you kill the human pathogens, the plant pathogens, the root feeding nematodes. You kill the weed seeds, the any kind of seed that's in there. And you start building structure in your compost. So typically within 21 days, the compost pile, the composting process is almost completely finished. If you've mm. got a pile that's lingering on, it, it's at 145 and it's been at 145 for three weeks, your pile went anaerobic. You mm. didn't pay attention to the signals mother nature was trying to send you you didn't smell your pile and go, oh, that's yeah. a little smelly. And what you do is you just take a, a like a broomstick and you punch um, chimneys mm -hmm. in the pile. Mm -hmm. So you're getting oxygen, you know, hot air rises, which means the colder outside air plunges to the bottom of those chimneys. Yeah. And you've cooled things off. You've brought in oxygen. You mm -hmm. cannot make the toxic chemicals um, that are causing this lingering will never um, cool off. It's those anaerobic products that are causing that problem. Get oxygen uh -huh. into your pile and you don't have to worry about that anymore. 
So working okay. with us is, yeah, we really, you know, when is it actually bad enough that you need to put in chimneys? When is it, well, you know, it's not that bad. You'll turn tomorrow morning, that should be close enough. So that's where we like to have that mentoring process going on. Gotcha. All right. So then let's talk about this. Cause like let's this spring, a friend of mine um, made some bad hay in, in big round bales. He almost, well, he caught it. He did catch the foot pile on fire. And so he gave yeah. me literally a small mountain of round bales. And so I've just piled them there. And then my plan on that is just let it sit for a couple of years and slowly decompose because I didn't want to have to break everything apart. And, you know, cause obviously I could, I could break it all apart, build it like you, like you just said, is there anything wrong with that? If I don't need this, let's say that compost right away, or do you think it's just worth it? Just starting to add some more materials in there, get it breaking down faster. Yeah, because you don't really want to be collecting more grass, uh, more of that brown material. And because mm -hmm. that, especially if that um, material got, um, and the bales got wet, then yeah. there is no green left in those bales. So now that's woody material, browns. Yeah. So use that as the browns in your piles. You don't have to break everything open right now. Just break apart as much as you need and mm -hmm. use that to get into your pile. Um, you know, and especially when you've got dry material like that, you want to make certain that you wet everything up to about 50% moisture before mm. you start yeah. the pile. You know, it's amazing how, you know, human beings can't do much work if we don't have water well mm, yeah microorganisms yep. are just like human beings if if That's you wouldn't like it, it yeah then they don't like it <laughs> so treat your your organisms well and they will treat you well so get so that's water a, in yeah there. that's another thing about keeping your soil moisture levels up never let your your soil dry out all the way yep because they, yeah you want that uh, organic matter layer on the surface of the soil because that's one of the best blocks mm -hmm. to evaporation. When you think about the color of your soil, and we've got it nice, rich, dark, 70% yeah. cocoa color, of course, the evaporation is going to be kind of nasty because mm -hmm. it's a dark color and that's going to yeah. heat and you're going to lose a lot of your water. So again, we want those perennial plants to be covering that all up. So you've got a green surface, which does not evaporate things as well. I know a lot of people have heard that, you know, you, uh, if you have anything understory below, below your plants, it's going to blow off all your water. Well, only if you've got weeds, mm. weeds are the only thing that do that. So get in those cover plants that don't evaporate, don't allow that kind of um, evaporation to happen from their surfaces. And you'll be amazed that you hold more water in your soil than you did back when it was mulched or mm -hmm. when you just had it bare. There's okay, so what kind of crops do you, what kind of understory crops do you like to see? A clover's a good mix? Clover is a good mix. Yep. Okay. You want to be careful on the kinds of clovers because a lot of them will vine up mm -hmm, mm -hmm. like on your, on your um, cotton, I guess where I've been recently um, on the corn or the wheat yep. or the barley, and they'll pull the corn right over. If oh, wow. you yep. so avoid those vining kinds of clover. So a Dutch white clover works yep. really well. Uh, Dichondra is another one. Okay. Uh, really inexpensive seed, you know, relatively speaking, you can get a lot, massive amounts of it. And then it's a perennial plant. Um, so I've even seen the dichondra survive through uh, a, a month of snow on top of it. And interesting. when the snow melts, it's just sort of there like, okay, it's gotten a little warmer. I can grow just a little faster. Yeah. So it's amazing what they'll survive. Now, is dicandra easy to terminate? Let's say we go after, so we move on to another crop. Is it relatively easy to get to, to disappear? Well, you wouldn't need to make it disappear. You just plant into the, the perennial plants that you've got. So okay. if you, like say you, this bed, um, in this field, you had uh, rows that were 10 inches apart. Now you want to go to rows that are five inches apart. Mm -hmm. um, you're just going to take out some of those perennial plants. Uh, and as long as you have a wide enough furrow, 
that you can get that seed into the ground or your start into the ground and get the um, plant material up above the yeah. perennial. And so we're always looking for things that don't grow more than maybe one to three inches. Gotcha. Okay. Because it's right. gotcha. enough yeah. protection and you don't ever have to worry about your perennial cover plants shading or you know fighting with the root systems of the crops that you want. Gotcha. Yeah. Cause then when we do the greenhouse crops, we do like tomatoes frequently in the summertime. So putting down an understory is great, but then we obviously switch to let's say winter greens. And so that's always an interesting transition for us to try to figure out. So, um, cause yep. we plant yeah, year round in those tunnels. There's a lot of things that are absolutely prostrate on the surface of the soil. Yeah. And so you just got to get the ones that are thick enough vegetation. So the weed seed doesn't get in between. Mm -hmm. the the um, branches of the above ground plant so uh, and we have lists um, gotcha okay yeah when you take the foundation courses we have page after page because you want to pick something that grows in your area and so we try to you know mm -hmm. these things grow really well these things are better over here um, and we keep adding to that knowledge base and we we don't know everything yet <laughs> So yeah. <laughs> uh, sometimes there's going to have to be some experimentation on your end as well. Yeah. All right. So we've talked compost, how important that is, the process behind it. Now let's talk. Um, now, do you recommend like inoculating the next compost pile with the previous one? Yes, absolutely. Okay. You okay. want to keep building that diversity because you never know what the weather's going to be like a week from now or mm -hmm five weeks or next summer, next fall, next spring, you don't know. And the only way you're really going to be able to protect yourself against those crazy you know, weather patterns mm -hmm, that come mm -hmm. your way is to have highly diverse sets of organisms, the communities of bacteria, fungi, protozoa, nematodes, microarthropods. Mm -hmm. You want that as diverse as you possibly can get, because then it means somebody's going to be awake and doing the work that the plant needs, no mm -hmm. matter what the temperature is, no matter what the rainfall is, no matter what is going on. Mm -hmm. It's like in a lot of our soils where we've been putting on compost, compost teas, compost extracts, which uh, teas and extracts are another really easy way to spread yes. these organisms. So instead yeah, I wanted of- Yeah, to move into that next. Yeah. Hey, Thriving Farmers, where are you on your Thriving Farmer journey? So if you go to our website, growingfarmers.com, you can click on the assessment button and that will take you to a form, ask you a few different questions, and that will help you figure out where you are on the five stage thriving farmer journey. And what that does then is kicks you a customized PDF that gives you resources to know exactly what to focus on next in your business to go to the next level. So go to growingfarmers.com and click on the assessment. So what's so the difference between a tea and an extract? With an extract, all you're doing is using um, the water to rip the organisms off the surfaces of the compost and into the water. So okay. you're just extracting. Of course, you're going to get all the soluble food, the soluble mm -hmm. nutrients that are in the compost. They're going to come with. So your microorganisms are coming with a little bit of food. They're coming a little bit um, of soluble nutrients, but not a lot. So what we like to do sometimes then, especially when we've got to get organisms onto the surfaces of plants, mm -hmm. um, especially if you plant starts and they're you know, getting up, up a little bit tall and you can see some of the edges starting to brown, that says you didn't get enough biology onto the leaf surfaces. So get out there with the tea. And the re what we do with the tea is we're going to add food when you add the microorganisms into the, um, into the, into the tea. And then you're going okay. to let that process, you're going to let those organisms grow on that food for about 24 hours in the middle of the summertime when it's hot, mm -hmm. 24 hours, 48 hours when it's a little bit cooler in the fall or the springtime. Just so you get the organism numbers up to a good mm -hmm. level so that you will completely cover the surfaces of all your leaves, your branches, your petioles, um, twigs, everything gets covered with mm -hmm. that really good biology. 
Okay, very cool. All right, that totally makes sense. So that would be like adding a food, let's say like uh, molasses or something like that, a bit more of a we, sugar. Yeah, we tend eh, we tend to stay away from uh, the sugars. Okay. Unless, so let me give you a little guidance there. Um, you have to look at what is in your soil, what's missing. Okay. So you, we give you charts of where are you in succession, mm -hmm. and if you're trying to grow grapevines then what you want is a ratio of five times more fungi than bacteria. And you want double the amount of um, fungal feeding nematodes mm -hmm. in that system. So that's what you're aiming for. You go and take a sample of your soil and there's nobody home except way too many bacteria. You don't want to be putting molasses into that tea. Uh-huh. Because you're going to grow more bacteria and that's the last thing you need oh, so you've okay. got to be looking for what is in my soil and therefore what do i have to adjust my compost extract or compost tea and it's easy with tea because you're going to put in a fungal food or yeah. you're going to put in um, bacterial feeding nematodes. You're going to put in fungal feeding nematodes if you're lacking those things. Putting in the protozoa when you've got massive amounts of bacteria so that the predators will get nutrient cycling up and going. They'll start building structure in your soil to hold water. They'll start uh, making certain that oxygen is going down as deep as it possibly can. So all the benefits are going to be balanced properly. Mm, okay. So I think that's what I did wrong. Cause a couple of years ago, I was trying to treat a brand new soil and we put in well, molasses into this and, and I didn't see a big difference. And I was like, huh, I wonder why I didn't see a much of a difference. And it's probably because I was encouraging the wrong type of microorganisms. Yep. You already had a lot of bacteria. You didn't yeah. need more. No, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That field, um, we bought a new farm last summer and the, the field had been in conventional corn and soy for 30 years. Um, in fact, when we got the, cause I called the, my friend who actually runs the spray company around here. And I was like, can you give me the spray report? They put 13 or there was like 11 different herbicides on that field the year before. Yikes. Yikes. Yeah. And yeah. all of them have such destructive oh, um, yeah. tendencies towards the biology. I, I think it's almost like a, a little, it's an evil plan that the big chemical companies use to make certain that you have no biology in your soil. Mm. So they're told you are totally dependent on them. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. It should yeah, not all are, you know. You're not sure. a conspiracy theorist here, are you? No. <laughs> <laughs> um, but let's, so let's talk about these nematodes because you talked about that a little bit. Do you guys have a, a source that you like for those? Is that something that there's out or is this something you have to kind of like do yourself? Well, it, it's always best if they are local. We, mm -hmm. we don't want to be taking organisms that aren't going to grow in your environment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's always best to, you know, get local producers of compost. And mm -hmm. then when they start making really good compost, you can take a pound or two of their compost mm -hmm. and extract out all of the beneficial nematodes. Mm -hmm. so, so let me ask you this. How do you tell if it's very good compost? You've got to have that microscope. Okay. So you can okay. So see... let's talk about that level. Yeah. Talk to us a little bit about why the microscope is so important. Because we know for different crops that we have to have different kinds of balances. Early successional mm. crops are going to be bacterial dominated, but you have to have some fungi or you're going to grow weeds. Yep. So are you balanced properly? The further you get along in succession, the closer you're going to get to, you need to have a equal biomass of bacteria and fungi. You mm. Minimum is 135 micrograms of fungi and 130 micrograms of bacteria. If you uh -huh. want higher yields, you're going to have to double or triple or quadruple the, the uh, biomass of those organisms. You want to have at least 100 uh, bacterial feeding nematodes. You want um, 50 of the fungal feeding nematodes and you want uh, you know maybe five or 10 of the predatory nematodes and you, you want to get the minimum in your soil. And one of the hardest things to rapidly get up and get going in your compost pile are the nematodes. They're the highest level predators. So we want to help them out. We may have to add some addi additional mm -hmm. inoculum of those 
nematodes. So we're going to take 20 pounds or 10 pounds, extract those nematodes so we can enhance. Now we have people who now make um, composts that have over 10,000 good guy nematodes in mm. their compost. So, you know, it's like, call up the closest person who's making yeah. the best compost and get a little bit of that. Maybe it's not going to be all of the indigenous organisms that they're going to have, but yeah. they're, it, it's going to move you along in the right direction. Gotcha. So if you go to our website, so foodweb.com, you look around and you find where all of the people are who are making compost for sale. And you uh -huh. contact the local, the, the closest ones. Um, and you, you know, you can always talk about, well, okay, what would you do for this kind of problem or for that kind of problem? And they will probably give you some pretty good answers, especially if they've been through our classes, they know the, mm -hmm. the right things to be doing. All right. So we've talked the teas, we've talked the extracts. Um, we've talked about the, the nematodes. So let's talk like long-term here. What is like the long-term impacts that you're seeing as when people will start to pay attention to the soil food web and really kind of, as you said, stop the tillage, treat the soil right. What kind of, you know, yield increases are you seeing or just soil health or even plant health? Yeah. It, um, the more you pay attention to the instructions, the higher the yield increases are going to be. So we can pretty well, I mean, if you follow the directions at least reasonably well, it'll be over 20% increase in yields. Mm -hmm. Now, it also depends on this on the summer. So we can't ignore Mother Nature. Yeah, um, she will pay us back in, in nasty stuff if we don't pay attention to her. So we've got to make sure those balances are staying um, properly aligned for the crop that you're trying to grow. But we have easily had in the first growing season where people start, they switch and they followed the directions pretty religiously, 300% um, increases in corn yield um, wow. with um, you know grass seed, with um, tomatoes, uh, yeah. easy to get. Well, there was a grower in um, South Africa that we've been working with for a long time that got over a thousand percent increase in yield mm. in the first growing season. And they are in uh, full-time uh, tomatoes. Okay. Uh, they, when we first came to work for them, they brought us in because they had to stay out of tomatoes, their cash crop for yeah. 14 years before oh, wow. they could grow one year's worth of tomatoes. And then mm -hmm. they had to go back into um, all the other yeah. know, ro sorghum, rye, all of those other things for another 14 years before they could grow tomatoes in there. That wow. really basically meant every year they were buying 10 new farms, five to 10 new farms, because they had to have new soil to grow their tomatoes on to maintain um, the yeah their their whole farming practices they started working with us and most of their tomatoes are now grown on the same ground year after year after year because we wow. don't have the diseases we don't have the yeah. pests we don't have a lack of nutrient cycling your mm -hmm. soil has all the nutrients in it that it needs to grow okay. plants of you... any kind yeah. And so I, that's something I've heard a lot of people say about your program is you talk about how that, that is true that like, let's say the soil has all the phosphorus, potassium, magnesium, sil silicon, all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Now, is there a point at the beginning of your transition where you still may need to add supplemental? Exactly. There may okay. be because you got to get the organisms into the soil. You've got to get mm -hmm. them functioning. And that means they got to work with each other and mm -hmm. your plant. And sometimes your plant is kind of just so out of whack mm -hmm. that it it's never seen these microorganisms behaving like this before. So they don't really trust them. Mm -hmm. well, okay. The, okay. the trust has to be reestablished where the plant is putting out the exudates to grow the bacteria and the fungi. And in that exudate that the plant puts out is basically a, a biochemical demand. They, you have to make this enzyme. And so mm. here's all the food that you need 
to go and grow this enzyme so you can extract the calcium or the magnesium or the boron or the zinc or, well, nitrogen, phosphorus, sulfur, whatever the plant needs. It's going to be basically telling these bacteria and fungi what it needs. And the bacteria and fungi, they're so happy at being fed that they, mm-hmm. they go, well, why not give, give the man what he wants? And <laughs> so they, you know, there they are. Um, uh, they sequester all yeah. of those nutrients in their bodies. And then that attracts the protozoa, the nematodes, the microarthropods. They come and eat those bacteria, release those nutrients and the plant takes them up because the, they are offered right at the, um, right there at the roots interface. And that's just one way. You could have mycorrhizal fungi. So we want to make certain that if your plant can be mycorrhizal, we want you to get the right mycorrhizal fungi into your soil. And you have that access to another set of nutrients, another way to get those nutrients. And then we want all those bacteria that perform the process of rhizophagy, Mm -hmm. where the plant puts out a special kind of glue and yep. entices these bacteria to be playing around in front of the root set of the root tip, yep. um, the root hair. And then the, um, the plant will kind of open up its pores, opens up the, the secret mouth and sucks all those bacteria, slams the door shut. And it puts out um, materials that eat away the cell um, wall Um, leaving that those bacteria very susceptible to the plant being able to pull out from the bacteria all the nutrients and the food that it needs now all those little bacteria they finally figure out the exit door is up there by the root hair okay so there they go they escape out the escape door they now are in the soil where all these wonderful nutrients are available and they suck in all those nutrients and they go right back around to the root tip. Mm, so they don't and, learn. <laughs> well, I think it's probably actually more like me and uh, roller coasters. Yes. You know? Okay. I get on the roller coaster and I'm just having a grandest time and you get off and you're kind of staggering and it's like, whoa, that was fun. And yeah. you run to the front of the line as fast as you possibly can. So you can have another ride. (laughs) Gotcha. Okay. So it's not like they're eating the bacteria. They're more just stripping out some of those nutrients and then releasing them back out to get more of it. Yep. Yep. So it's just, it's a roller coaster ride. It's an amusement park. This is Disney world. Yes. So (laughs) they have a grand time. Um, A few of them lose their lives. That's true. But, you know, I think the majority of them are just having such a good time. They don't care. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Okay. So then if that's happening under the soil, then when is the time to be adding the, like the compost teas to spray it on the plants? Is that for more when you see problems and you're not sure if the the ground is not okay? In the first year, you're going to want to, as soon as you've got leaves, you want to be out there spraying them because- Mm -hmm. It, when the soil is still trying to get the balances all figured out and growing things and the plants going, whoa, I don't know if I trust you. Yeah. Um, you're not getting everything up into the top uh, of the, um, on those leaves. So you need to be applying those uh, compost teas. So, you know, let's, um, I usually apply the first application of the compost tea at the first true leaf stage. Okay. Yep. Um, the next one I apply a month later. Okay. And then a month after that, at which point I'm going to check the soil to see how are things going on, on down there? Have you got all the right balances? Do you need a little help maybe? And I'd put in the mix of the organisms that would fix any missing organism groups that are present. If your fungi are too low, if your protozoa are too low, we're going to make certain that you're going to add enough of those organisms to really give the the soil kind of a shot in the arm so Mm -hmm. that we can get the organisms being carried from the soil up into the foliage, and then you don't have to do that work anymore. So I might well, well put out a foli, a, a soil spray, and then a foliar mm-hmm. spray at the same time, 
just to make sure that we bring the soil back up. And so we make certain that we're protecting your plant. By the time you get to the plant has accumulated all the nutrients it needs um, through that early growing season. And now it's starting to go into reproduction. From that point on, it's not, uh, doesn't happen very often for the plant to get diseased or attract an insect pest or something like that. So typically not gonna be a problem. Well, unless you've got strange weather. And mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Oh boy, have the last couple of years been strange weather. Oh yeah. So okay. then what you're saying, if you have a healthy plant, the healthy plant is not going to let insects attack it very easily because it's just not going to attract those insects. Yep. And it's, you know, got the strong uh, cell walls, the things that uh, try to stuck, stick, you know, their proboscis through and suck out the mm -hmm. um, cytoplasm of all your uh, plant cells. They, they just can't do it because the plant is so well protected. Mm -hmm. And typically, if we've established that biology on all of the surfaces of the above ground part of the plant, you, the, the problem organisms can't even get to the surface of the plant. Mm -hmm. So all of that protection's in place. It's impossible. You're not mm -hmm. going to have disease. Gotcha. Gotcha. Now, let's talk a little bit about, because you talk about like virgin soils compared to, you know, more uh, traditionally farmed soils. And you also talk about the conifer deciduous riparian. Let, go into a little bit of that. Is, is there like a big difference in some of those soils? And like, if you're going to be farming them or some of them that you wouldn't want to be farming ever? Well, uh, when we're dealing with riparian or wetland areas, yeah. that means that that soil has been waterlogged for part of the growing season. It's been anaerobic. And so when you're kind of impinging on a riparian or wetland area, you could have some real problems growing your terrestrial plants mm -hmm. because terrestrial plants are obligately aerobic. They've yeah. got to have oxygen. They start putting their root systems down into some place that uh, is anaerobic and all of your sulfur has been converted into hydrogen sulfide. <laughs> yeah, doesn't yeah. grow very good te terrestrial plants. Your nitrogen has been lost as nitrous oxide or ammonia into the atmosphere. There's mm -hmm. not a lot, lot of nitrogen left that your plant can um, take up or deal with. And the mechanisms that a terrestrial plant has for obtaining what it needs does not include anaerobic conditions. It just mm. can't deal with those problems. So if you're aware and you're going, gosh, it's really swampy in this field, you can do things to uh, put the microorganisms into the, back into that system that will rebuild the structure and cause greater infiltration Mm. deeper down into the soil. Um, yeah. There are a lot of people who will tell you that your roots can't grow through a waterway, that they can't go through an aquifer. And my response is, oh, yes, they can. As long as that yeah. water is aerobic, no mm -hmm. problem going, you know, growing those root systems. Think about hydroponics. <laughs> That's what yeah. we're doing. We're growing in wetland conditions, but we're managing so that that always stays aerobic. All that circulation has to happen to keep all of that water aerobic. So imagine a, a wetland situation is just being a giant hydroponics system mm -hmm. and you've got to keep that oxygen in the water. So as we get in later and later into um, old growth forests, so you're mm -hmm. getting the really old oak trees and you know enormous, gorgeous, beautiful trees. That means that soil is going to be too fungal for mm -hmm. your crop plants. When you take down an old growth forest and you think you're going to go in there and grow really great tomatoes because boy, those were beautiful sequoia. Yeah, you are going to have a, a real shock and unhappiness. Because yeah. you've got to get the balance right. And for our row crops, our veggies, most of those um, plants are down around um, a ratio of 0.8 units of fungal biomass to every one unit of bacterial biomass up to five units 
of fungal biomass for every one unit of bacterial biomass. So mm -hmm. those fungal to bacterial ratios have to get altered. When you think about the fungal to bacterial ratio in an old growth forest, like if you go up to um, you know, the peninsula in Washington state to the old growth cedar forest, when you go out in the springtime, right after the snow melts, and you try to stick your hand into that soil, it's just this massive um, amount of fungal biomass. All of these strands are mm -hmm. holding everything together. And if you're patient and you pick out all the fungal biomass that you can see with your eyes and put it on a plate, dry it down and measure the weight, 75% of the weight of a gram of soil or a teaspoon of soil will be fungal biomass. Mm. Now, as soon as the uh, flying squirrels wake up, as soon as the, the critters uh, wake up, they are all ready and set for a fungal food fest. And mm. they just ream that forest floor, eating all the truffles, eating all of the mushrooms, just mm -hmm. having the grandest time. But it's perfectly okay because when they go back to sleep, because winter's coming, now the fungi have the chance to regrow. Mm. And now they got have all of that soil built, you know, the structures rebuilt, everything is in place, no leaching, no erosion will happen because the fungi completely regrow and we're back to three quarters of the uh, weight of a gram is fungal biomass. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's okay. amazing. Yeah. So now how do you convert that back into a system where you're going to grow tomatoes? Yeah. It's going to take some effort. Yeah. So and on one aspect, I'd love, I'd hate to see any managed forest with those beautiful trees turned into tomato yeah, land, right. but uh, sometimes it does happen, unfortunately. Yeah. So it is more of a process with those. It's just, you don't do it immediately. You're going to have to do a couple year transition in that kind of case. Yep. And you, you're going to disturb that soil a couple times pretty drastically mm -hmm. in order to get that conversion to happen. And you just have to hope the squirrels don't come after you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you took our forest food away yes. from us. We're going to get you. So, yeah, I don't, we've lost so much of our forest that we can't be doing that kind of um, work anymore. You know, put the old growth aside. Now, go back to your orchards and start treating your orchard like it's um, old growth forest. Uh -huh. And you'll be amazed at the improvement in yields and the flavors and the quality. And, you know, there's so much work going on right now that is showing that, you know, like an apple has something like only 20% of the nutrients that used to be in apples. Like when mm. I was growing up, yeah, um, you, you ate an apple and man, you had all the nutrients you needed. We've lost 80% or maybe it's only 70%, but a huge amount of the nutrition is gone from all of the foods. And it's because we've lost biology in the soil. The plants can't get those nutrients. They try their best, but they're stressed all the time, which is why the pesticides have to be used so often. Yeah. So we've got to get all of this biology back into the soil. And you can very rapidly measure that the nutrients are being put back into those foods. Mm -hmm. So everything, we've got to do it for everything. All right. So right, you mentioned before a little bit ago, hydroponics, and that's one thing I think the real soil movement is something that, you know, people are talking about high hydroponics shouldn't be organic. What's your thought on that? Is soil uh, produce food? Well, good soil produce food, because obviously there's a difference. Always going to have more nutrients than a hydroponic system? No, you can um, be improving what's going on in your hydroponic system. Okay. It's just that you've got to get the root systems down into the water and you have to get the organisms established on those root systems. Mm -hmm. When you think about soil, the place where all the microorganisms are actually living is in the soil solution. Mm -hmm. So they're really all still aquatic organisms, except most of them gotten pretty skinny because they yeah. need to slip their way through the sand, silt and clays in order to get um, structure rebuilt for you. So 
it's really an aquatic system if you think of it as the sand silt clays rocks pebbles and organic matter are just stationary objects that the organisms are going to go around so we can do the same thing with the uh, hydroponic system we have to get all of the root systems of the plants re-inoculated with the proper balance okay. of all of the organisms that it needs to be able to take the nutrients out of that water. Well, okay, now how are you going to keep the nutrients flowing through your hydroponic system? If your plants are sucking up everything it possibly can through the bacteria and fungi, protozoa, and nematodes being eaten by the predators releasing nutrients for your plant to take up, or you've got mycorrhizal fungi happening, or you've got rhizophagy happening. And I suspect that rhizophagy is probably a bit more of an important source of nutrients in hydroponic systems than the other two forms. Okay. So can, can we do some experiments where we get all three equally colonized and then we see which ones which plants have the most nutrients if we start deleting this or that? Well, lots of, there are so many research projects we need to do. It's a, a little daunting. Mm -hmm. but yeah. That would be one that would be, especially for the hydroponics people, proving that yeah. it's just as good to grow things hydroponically if you understand the biology of the system. So yeah. get the nutrients in there. What is it that you're going to put into the waterways to bring the kinds of nutrients to keep the bacteria and the fungi, protozoa, and nematodes happy, well, it's humic acids. Gotcha. You just have to put those humic acids into that water, and then you're going to be monitoring the color of your water to make certain that you've got the concentration of the nutrients balanced at what the microorganisms need. Take little bits of the root system of your plant out, put it on the microscope slide and see if you've got everybody home. Mm -hmm. um, you look at it and you go, what happened to all my fungal feeding nematodes? Where'd they go? They're not in here. Okay, so you need to add those back. What's missing? Mm. Replace it so that all of your plants can stay healthy and happy and not succumb to the diseases, not to succumb to any of the fungal diseases, you know, no insect pests. And then we always take all of our residues of the plants that we've been growing. Um, you know, we take the harvest and that goes, gets sold, but we take the rest of the plant and we put that into the compost pile. Mm -hmm. All right. So humic acids too, those uh, sometimes can come from coal. Is that correct? Yeah. Um, they're, they take soft brown coal, which mm -hmm. is called leonardite. Yeah. And that's a good source of uh, humic acids. It's kind of a chemical nightmare, however, because yeah. they, you know, they take really strong acids and try to pull out the, I always get confused. Is it the uh, humic acids are the fulvic acids. And then they take a really strong acid and try to pull out of the coal, whatever it didn't get by going hugely um, uh, alkaline, back and forth, back and forth. And I think that's got to do something to the structure of the humics and the fulvics because they just don't feed the microorganisms well enough. Mm. My, the best place to get your humic acid from is your compost pile. Yeah, 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 absolutely. And it's all natural. It's in the form that the fungi can use. You want a little more bacteria, well, then uh, fulvic acids, mm -hmm. uh, maybe some omic acids, and you just extract them with water. So there's no toxic chemicals. There's no, what do I do with this stuff now? Um, so yeah. A lot gotcha. of this nutrient cycling fits together if you just understand how nature works. Mm -hmm. All right, one more thing, and then we will start to wrap this up here. Um, what is, obviously, you have farmers buying new farms or getting on new farms all the time. Is there any advice you'd have to someone who's like looking for a farm for picking their soil? Um, or, I mean, are you under the opinion that you know any soil can be approved to good quality? Obviously, there's some soils better than others. Yep. I'm of the attitude that we can always fix whatever problem you have. You know, soil 
engineers always get down to, well, how much sand, how much silt, mm -hmm. how much clay? And we've got to balance that. And the best soils are 33% sand, silt, and clay. No, they're not. You can very rapidly improve a clay soil or sand or a, a silt, something that's pure silt, whatever, um, if we get the organic matter back into the soil. Okay, you're going to have to make a fair amount of compost if you're needing to put back in you know, 10%, 15%, 20% ultimately is kind of where you want to get to. Mm -hmm. But by the time you're at 20% organic matter, it doesn't matter what kind of sand, silt, or clay fractions you had. There, most of the time, I can, I can really challenge people mm -hmm. who say, I can tell a clay soil from 50 yards. You know, okay, great. So let's come over here. Um, how about this field? What, what is this field? Give me your opinion on the sand, silt, and clay fractions in this soil. And they'll pick the handful up and, you know, smell it and, you know, crunch it and yeah. you know, all Smear their little, it. yeah. And, and they say, this is a great soil. This is, uh, it feels like it's a uh, 30% clay, 30% yeah. silt, 30% sand. And I go, no, it's a hundred percent organic matter. Mm hmm and they just look at you like, you're lying to me, woman. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, take the soil, take uh, some of that, stick it in a jug, shake it up, and then watch the sand, the silt, the clay filter out. There's, you know, down on the bottom, maybe a quarter inch of sand, silt, or clay. The rest of it's organic matter. Uh -huh. we can we've taken soils that are pure sand. Any engineer at the beginning... This is pure sand. And I'll Each. agree with them. That's, yeah. yep, it's pure sand. And we get that organic matter back into the soil. And by the time they come out at the end of the growing season, put, pick their hand up and go, oh, wow, this is great soil. Where, where did you find great soil like this to put back in this field? Mm. Yeah. You know, when we look at the sand silt clay fractions of that soil. There we are at the jug. We shake it up. It's a hundred percent sand, mm -hmm. but it's now also twenty percent organic matter. So the challenge then is just making that organic matter stay there, and the solution is just no tillage and keeping your soil covered. Yep. Keep feed. Make certain that you've got those perennial plants in there, because yeah. then you have constant feeding, and you don't lose any of your nutrients. Leaching does not happen to speak of. Yeah. Um, so, you know, anything downhill from you, they're not going to get the runoff. They're not going to get the toxic stuff anymore. So you keep it all, you keep all the good stuff and you don't have to apply any of the toxic stuff. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So talk to us a little bit about your courses because you have a full range, the Soil Food Web School. Um, talk to us about, you know, who are those four and, uh, and, and, and what's the, the time frame? So the foundation classes are where we, the first um, foundation class, we teach you the basic um, knowledge that you're going to need to do all of the rest of the courses. Um, so foundation course two is we teach you how to make compost um, within, you know, a 20 day cycle typically, and we teach you, you know, how to recognize all the different kinds of starting materials go out into the forest and figure out how much of what you've got you may have to put in a couple fields and then take you step by step through the composting operation. Mm. Um, so you, you're making, we, we want you to make at least three uh, compost piles. And so we've always discovered that nobody can make good compost the first time round. You're mm -hmm. always going to mess up on something because there's a lot of kind of nitpicky stuff that yeah. becomes second nature to you very rapidly and then you don't even think about it you forget to tell people come into your you know they're going to come train with you and you forget all of the picky stuff that you learned and yep well then they get to fail their first pile too um, so the second the third foundation course is um, teaching you how to make extracts and how to make teas how to apply them how to determine whether it's a really good tea is this tea correct for the property that you're putting it onto? Well, what's missing in that property? And now you've got to make that tea 
So it's going to put it back in the missing organisms or mm -hmm. extract or, and we go through, why would you use compost? Why would you use extract? Why would you use teas? The th fourth um, of the foundation courses is to teach you how to use the microscope. So you don't have to be sending samples off to people or, well, you know, maybe you really don't want to use the um, the microscope very much and you want to have a neighbor, you, you don't care. You can write all the your testing off as uh, taxes for, some, for Uncle Sam. So why not pay somebody else? Fine, yeah. if that's what you want to do, we'd like to at least teach you the basics. So you could get at least an idea of what's going on in your own soil, especially when you've got some disease that, it, you know, you you just forgot about this corner of your property and the disease is um, taking over in here and you don't want that to happen, you can quickly assess what you should be doing out there. So once you've passed through the foundation courses, then if that's all you want, you want to go home and start working on getting everything worked out fine, you can always um, sign up for a couple hours worth of mentoring um, with whoever you want to men get uh, mentoring with. Um, and that's always safer to have some a backup mm -hmm. that you can always call. But let's say you decide that you want to be a laboratory. You want to be doing these assays for other people and sending out the results. So we get you to the point where your reading of any soil is going to be the same as anybody else who has gone through this training. So we don't have the problem of kind of untrained people where uh, after a year or two, they start, they stop remembering exactly what a fungus looked like. Mm. And they start counting strange stuff yeah. as a, uh, yeah. It's like, um, you know, I don't know if you know the microbiome meter. When you okay. go and when you go look at that, what they're calling fungal hyphae, and they count as fungal hyphae, those aren't fungi at all. That's mm. organic matter. And they're calling that, you know, and saying that we, Soil Food Web, don't know how to recognize fungi. It's just, it's, it's laughable. Yeah. It's just kind of, yeah, let's have a one-to-one -one head on contest. And, uh, <laughs> We can, yeah. So yes, you've been doing this how many years again? <laughs> yeah, and they've been doing this what five years? Yeah. Um, they don't. So um, we want to make certain that everybody that we have certified is going to be counting that soil, the organisms in that soil, in exactly the same way, and they're going to come up with exactly the same numbers, plus or minus the typical variation that there is from. Um, gram to gram of the material that you look at when you put it under the microscope. And some people like to say, well, you look at such a minute amount of the soil. Let me remind you that when you get a soil chemistry test done, they're looking at at least a uh, dilution factor of about 100 times less the sample in the material that they're measuring your chemistry in. Mm as compared to what we're using when we're looking at biology. If you're not getting mm -hmm. good counts, you count more of the soil. So we've got that part figured out as well. If I didn't see anybody in five fields of view, I'm going to go to 10 fields of view. I may mm -hmm. just keep looking at more and more and more and more fields until I finally find a fungal hypha. And mm -hmm. so it, you figure out that there really isn't any fungal hyphae in this soil to speak of, you know, zero to the nth degree is still zero. Yeah. Yeah. So why do we have to get that fussed about it? So when they, when the microbiome meteor does their work, they're taking almost the same amount of soil as we are to assess the biology. So it's, you know, some of those, those, uh, objections to what we do is they're just made up yeah yeah so they it's it's not going to be a, a, a true it's not going to be a true reading of that at all yeah they take a little um spinner and they use that spinner to 
mix their soil. Well, they just sliced and diced and crushed most of the nematodes, mm. the mm. Uh, protozoa, and the fungi. Mm, so really, gotcha. yeah. all they're measuring is what happens with bacteria. Yeah. Which is very different from what we're doing, where we gently shake, and we've done lots of testing on um, how hard is too hard. Yeah, gotcha. Yep. So you have that exact down. Very cool. Yep. Well, Elaine, I know we could literally go on for days. I mean, I, every, <laughs> there's so many questions I still have, but then we'll have to wait for another time. I appreciate your time. Um, yep. today. This was a Probably great just one more, one more thing I'd like to touch yeah. base with. Um, we have just started with a certified growers uh, package and then the certified um, consultant package. So people want to come and learn how to be consultants. And that means we're going to teach you about what you got to think about mm. and how you interpret things, because that's really critical to the job of a consultant. Whereas with the growers, we want you to concentrate on your property. And so mm. everything you do should be on your property. And so the mentors that you get are going to be people are constantly saying, okay, now on your property, what are you seeing? We're not mm -hmm. trying to teach you how to deal with the whole rest of the world. Um, it's just the, the growers and the consultants. So mm -hmm. we have basically the, inf the foundation course, the microscope tech, the grower um, program, mm -hmm. and then the consultant program. Which what pathway do you want? And you come and we start helping you learn what you want to know. Gotcha. So you meet pretty much everyone where they're at and there's, there's, there's some sort of, of ladder or path of success for each type of person. Yep, exactly. And we Very keep cool. adding new classes too. So that's, that's what's going to keep me busy for the rest of my life. <laughs> gotcha. Yes. It's just continuing to build out the uh, uh, unpacking that uh, amazing brain of yours. So, yep. I mean, how many books have you written? I was, I'm looking at a bibliography here and it's, there's a lot here already. Yeah, I, um, uh, uh, I've written a lot of scientific articles. So, you know, when somebody says, Elaine's never written a scientific article, it's uh, very apparent that those people can't read. Yeah. Because there's over 100 publications uh, in my CV. When, by the time you add them all up, the books and the magazine articles and the, um, you know, manuals, the, all of those, and then the proper scientific uh, yeah. papers the I never stop writing. Uh, yeah. There's always another manual to be produced, especially as we keep um, coming across new ways to do things and we've got to test them out. It's like the rise of AG. Uh, I had to test that out and make sure that that really works and surprise. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what are there more ways that the plant that the root is feeding itself like that? Probably. We just mm -hmm. haven't paid enough attention yet. So yeah. there's lots more to learn. We have only begun. When you realize that people, that microbiologists are starting to say that there are probably over a billion species of bacteria on mm. this planet. And we only know, we have only named 5,000 of oh, those wow. billions org of organisms. It just... Well, how about the bacteria that grow and live in molten lava? Mm, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We, haven't, we haven't figured, we haven't even tested places. Um, I want to know about the bottom of the hot springs that are, that are pure hydrochloric acid. I mm -hmm. wonder what lives down there, but I'll bet there's something that does live down there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Just because we haven't looked doesn't mean they aren't there. So. Yeah. Lots gotta, yet. Yeah, got to figure out how to get down there and sample. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. What kind of metal do you put down to the bottom of that thermal pool in Yellowstone National Park and yeah. uh, uh, to get that sample? And then you can't touch it once it's up here. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, fascinating stuff. It is. So thank you very much for letting me have the time to talk about all of this. Absolutely. Well, thank you for coming on. It's uh, an honor to be able to speak with you. And uh, again, thank you for your work because without it, we would be decades behind in understanding what's going on underneath the soil we, we stand on every day. That's right. It's the last frontier.
Is the soil be beneath our feet? <laughs> Absolutely. All right. Well, you have a great rest of your day, Elaine, and we'll uh, we'll keep in touch. Okay. Take care, Michael. Thanks. Ciao. Hey, Thriving Farmers. Have you checked us out on YouTube lately? We have a bunch of new content there, including a few rants by me. I uh, want to tell you, you don't want to miss them. Um, I actually go rant about you know some of the problems I see in our space and some of the challenges I see farmers uh, facing. So go check that out. We've got instructional videos over there as well. Talk about setting up our new farm here in Ohio and all the steps we're going to do that, as well as just tutorials and tips on best practices for all sorts of things on the farm. So go ahead, check over at Growing Farmers on YouTube and see the new content we put together for you. So there you have it, another episode in the books. So I'd love if you would hop on over to iTunes and leave us a rating and a review. Those mean everything to us. We love to hear what you're thinking. If you have a podcast guest that you can recommend, please pop on over to the Thriving Farmer podcast website and leave us a review. That's thrivingfarmerpodcast.com.